This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. And coming up next is one of the most wild shows we have ever done. Um, the guest is pseudonymed Giannis Yaweasel. He's the parent main hacker of Craig and on WeCast, which are great audio production things. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, but it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so Jonathan... Bennett and I talk with him for an hour about all kinds of stuff, and that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 660, recorded Wednesday, December 15th, 2021. Open source audio and the weasel. Hello again, and good whenever it is, wherever you are, I and wherever you are, I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly. I am joined today by Jonathan Bennett, who is not in a new place, which I, which I am. <laughs> hey, Doc. <laughs> It, yeah. it is good to be here. Yeah, I'm still I'm still in Oklahoma, the flyover state at the uh, corporate headquarters, the home office. And, uh, you know, we're probably probably going to be here for a while. We did our traveling for Thanksgiving, and uh, I think we're done with that for a while. So, yeah, yeah, look forward to me from right here. Mine never ceases. I I, I was the last few shows I've been in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, another flyover state. And um, and we left uh, on Saturday morning after my phone kept telling me over and over again that tornadoes might be coming, and they did come. They came about 80 miles away, as you know, made the news. Mm -hmm. um, but we got the warnings all night, and then we went out, waited, waited outside for a lift that didn't come, and finally took an Uber that came and got <laughs> got, got out of there. I'm uh, not at home in Santa Barbara. I'm actually in somebody else's house in Los Angeles at the moment, <laughs> and having just sort of rigged up what we're doing here. So um, our 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 guest today, uh, Giannis Yaweasel, who is not, which is not his name. <laughs> so what do you know about this so far, uh, Jonathan? We have a very well, entertaining show coming up today. Oh, it, it'll, it'll be great. Um, so <laughs> I guess there's, there's two big things to mention here. First off, uh, well, I don't want to ruin the surprise, but he's coming to us anonymously, which, yeah. uh, is not the decision that we've made. Obviously, Doc, we've both put our real names out there and some information about where we're at. But I don't know about you, but I can understand why somebody would want to do that, particularly in kind of the the culture of the internet that we have today. Uh, and so we'll make sure to ask him about that. But but really what we're here to talk with him about are the the programs uh, Craig and on WeCaster, right. which Craig particularly I use every week when we do the uh, Untitled Linux show that is the program we use to record in Discord, and it gives us a great multi-track recording. Um, and so that's that that is uh, that's one of the projects that he's worked on, and the other one is something new on WeCaster, and it is essentially intended to be a replacement for you know all the various video conferencing apps, and it's supposed to have high quality recording built right into it. And so that's pretty interesting too. In fact, I've thought very hard about going ahead and buying a license or buying, uh, let's see, what, what would the right term there be? Um, signing up for a subscription because it's, it's, you know, software as a service, uh, even it is open source, but rather than going through the, the pain of trying to set up hosting myself, um, because of some of the other things I do, it could be very useful. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to asking him about all three of those things. I, I, I'm afraid he is terribly, terribly interesting in what he's doing here. And I, 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 and I've, it made me think a lot. Like, if I were beginning now, would I want to do the same thing? Because mm -hmm. um, I, I like my privacy. I like my anonymity. Um, he's a pseudonym rather than an anonym. Uh, an anonym, I guess there is no such thing True. as an anonym because you don't have one. It's to be nameless. So he's neither nameless nor faceless, but it is not his name and not his face. <laughs> so, so I want to bring him on. Actually, we, we're going to go into a news item first, but we already started ahead of time, and he already had good things to say about that. So, so welcome, Giannis, who is not Giannis, uh, in his persona, which is a, for those of you who are video enabled, uh, you'll see he's not human here. There he is. Yeah. But he's a he, him. Oh, an escapee from the island of Dr. Moreau. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And your whiskers, your whiskers that are not really whiskers go almost all, all, all the way to the edge. So, so, um, I, I quickly fill us in on what um, 
what Jonathan may have missed in introducing you is, you know, by, by way of helping people know what you're about uh, or who you are um, in case anything's missing there. Yeah, so uh, I have become somewhat known in the podcasting community because of Craig and Discord and uh, on WeCaster now, uh, but I don't even have a podcast. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I I fell into this because I play extremely obscure video games. I have a channel where I, I do recordings of video games that you've never heard of, that I had never heard of, that are just like, it's sort of a... a obsession with archival kind of thing. Uh, mm. So that's that's how I fell into this. And I sometimes like to record with friends and the situation of recording online just was was terrible. And so that's that's what led me into this. So I, I sort of fell into this field in a very weird way, which is perhaps the uh, the most surprising thing. That's great. So, so let's let's before we get into your stuff, we, we sometimes try to get in a little bit of news ahead of time. And there's a uh, uh, there was a um, uh, a problem that uh, with Apache that Alibaba, which is a Chinese giant, discovered, um, and kind of handed it over to the community to do what the community does, what the Apache community does, and fix this thing. Um, and Jonathan, you've kept up better with this than I have. So to tell us where we're at now with it. And and Giannis, you feel free to jump in as well because you had some cool things to say about it earlier. Yeah, so it's it's related to Apache, the, the organization, not Apache, the web server. Uh, it's, it's log4j, which is a Java library for logging. And it's a very popular one, and it's used in a whole bunch of things. Like Minecraft is one of the one of the big ones. Um, I think a bunch of Android apps use it, uh, and then a lot of enterprise Java applications use it. Well, there's this little problem that if you log just the right string that contains a link, a, a specially formatted link, uh, off to I believe. The, the thing I've seen so far is off to a, an LDAP, LDAP, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol Server. It will go do the lookup and then execute the code that comes back. And hopefully you see why that's a problem because, you know, you you then have a very easy way to get arbitrary code execution. And uh, I believe that article stated that like the ninth of this month, they so knowing what the flaw is, people have now looked back through their logs and internet traffic, and they've seen this being exploited as of, and, and I believe it was December 9th. So it was a in the wild zero day for a few days there before somebody found it. And, and the good thing is that probably none of this are running this on our own desktops, uh, you know, unless of course you play Minecraft, which then you you might have a problem. Um, but again, a lot of enterprise software runs it. And uh, I've already seen stories where people are getting hit, you know, big companies are getting hit because of that. And then uh, I was I was saying before the show, I'm getting emails now from one of my clients who are getting um, scary, accurate spear phishing, which spear phishing is a fake, a scam email where someone has a lot of information that they've included as a part of the scam. And so it looks very legitimate. Um, one of my clients is getting spear phishing emails and I'm wondering if it's not data that someone got as a result of this uh, particular vulnerability. So it's definitely uh, still an ongoing story. Uh, at least one person, I believe Dan Gooden on Ars Technica, uh, has made the statement that, as far as he can tell, this may be the most serious vulnerability of all time. I don't know that it'll go quite that wow. far yet, but it's definitely in the running for it. Uh, Yanis, you were you were chatting about this. You you want to add in your two cents? What what your uh, perspective on this is? Yeah, I, so there there's a an issue that that can be overlooked. That like if this sort of thing happens with a package that happens to be written in C or C++, then, you know, Debian and every other distribution will pick up on it really fast. And if you just do apt upgrade or, or just have some regular security patches, it'll patch itself. But a lot of languages have this culture where the way you, you handle packages is, oh, I'm just going to throw in a jar file or, you know, in, in JavaScript, it'll just be a, a something in my node modules directory. And 
and mm. it, it ain't going to update itself. And so this, when when there's a security and a uh, flaw in something that's written in Java, it can be years before uh, everybody is sort of noticed. Oh, actually, I do have a log for J jar <laughs> file sitting around doing something. It they they don't yeah. get updated very automatically in a lot of cases. So mm. this this could be nasty just in terms of how long it takes to sort of resolve itself too. Uh, like like some of the nastier radioactive elements, it's going to have a very long half life. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting uh, insight yeah. <laughs> into it. All right, well, shall we move into uh, maybe talking about Craig first? I, I'm I'm find it fascinating that you you came at this rather than you know being a podcaster or anything else. You came at this first as a YouTuber. Um, it, it, is the term <laughs> VTuber accurate there? Uh, and and then uh, tell us a little bit more about kind of the 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 impetus for Craig. A tuber sounds like a root vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, VTuber has accidentally become accurate. Uh, I I don't know how much I like that term. Uh, anyway, uh, so. Years ago, in like 2016, if I wanted to play some multiplayer game, some very obscure multiplayer game with friends, uh, we would all hop on Mumble and Mumble as a button to record in multi-track. And it's mm -hmm. not amazing, but it's fine. It, it works. Uh, and then everybody jumped ship to Discord. And Discord, I, I mean, Discord is garbage for a lot of reasons, <laughs> but one of the, the many reasons why it's garbage uh, is that it doesn't have any similar feature. It doesn't even have a single track mixed recorder built in. Uh, and so... I just, I, I needed some way of recording Discord because I, I needed multi-track recording to, to have any sort of decent quality or editing ability of, of this. And everybody had jumped ship, so I was f uh, forced to do it on Discord. So I just, I, like, over a weekend wrote this bot uh, that, that could do that. <laughs> And I, you know, I made it free and open source because it's sort of very niche. Like if you want a high quality recording, if, you know, if quality is your first concern, you're going to do some kind of double ender. You're going to have local recording and make sure that everybody is is being recorded in the highest possible quality. Craig is recording after internet transmission. So it's sort of already massacred by Discord. Uh, and I, I figured, well, that's that's niche enough. It, you know, some people have use for it, whatever. And it got ridiculously popular like absurdly popular uh, to the point where it's kind of constantly on the brink of collapse because Discord uh, just doesn't <laughs> like bots having many connections. And so, it, yeah, it, it really ballooned uh, a lot more than I ever expected it to. Ha have you gotten any uh, official contact from Discord regarding Craig? As popular as it is, I, I would almost expect that they would they'd reach out to you on, on some level. Uh, God, no. Uh, so other than uh, they they required verification at some point, and so there was some small contact with uh, Discord to to get verified. Discord, they, they don't understand their own bot API. There is no one within Discord who actually understands particularly the voice part of the bot API. That's a very sort of... Uh, 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 angry thing for me to say, but it appears to be entirely true from my uh, whole experience. So anytime oh. I, you know, report bugs or try and get in contact, they're beyond useless. Uh, so <laughs> they certainly don't have some, you know, army of of people trying to help out bot developers going around and and you know saying what can we do better to help because they they don't even they yeah they they don't care about bots. They do not care about bots. <laughs> uh, so I, I was it was just whispered in my ear that I must ask where did the name Craig for Craigbot come from? <laughs> uh so it did it did actually originally arise from a game. I wanted it to just be a sort of weirdly human, like like something you would personify in a sort of uncomfortable and awkward way. Uh, uh, <laughs> years ago, I was recording. I don't even remember what the game was, but it had it was it was a three D first person shooter, and it had 
uh, some, you know, comic relief background character who would uh, chime in every once in a while. And just spontaneously, I started saying, shut up, Craig, shut up. Uh, and so then Craig, this fictional Craig character became like the the punching bag. Uh, and so then when I was making this bot, I named it Craig just so that I could, you know, awkwardly act like it's a person that's actually doing the recording. Uh, and, and people like to, you know, they list their recording engineer as Craig or whatever, just to <laughs> nice. sort of weirdly personify it. Uh, I, I think we have all that have used it uh, or have tried to use Discord, Craig on Discord, we've spent at least a few moments shaking our fists going, Craig, why are you not working right? So thank you for that. <laughs> Now I'm, yeah, I'm, by, I'm making, curious. by making Craig a person, I don't get the blame. Craig does. <laughs> you get another pseudonym, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'm I'm curious when somebody uses Craig on on their Discord server, how much of that are you actually hosting for them, or does I, I honestly don't understand how Discord bots work at all. I've not looked into the programming of it. So whenever whenever any of us use Craig, do we need to? Should we really be sending you a little tip saying thank you because you're still hosting part of it? <laughs> uh, so. Craig ought to be really cheap to run because it's very sort of efficiently implemented and it it can uh -huh. easily scale. Uh, but because it scaled a lot more than I anticipated, uh, so the the big thing is just the the sheer disk space. So like the server for Craig, it's a dedicated server. I pay about two hundred fifty dollars a month uh, to run the actual Craig server, uh, and you know the the actual voice chat, which is the the you know, heavy part, that's Discord, that's not Craig, but the recording, that's Craig. Uh, so, uh, it, it, you know, it's all that capturing, it's all that receiving audio and saving it and processing it, that's, that's what Craig is doing. The actual sort of live chat part, that's Discord, that's always been Discord, uh, but disk space surprisingly isn't cheap, considering how cheap it is. <laughs> Uh, we, yeah, that's that's specific, particularly when you're uh, paying someone else to manage it for you, like yeah. AWS or Google. Um, well, then, from all of us that use it, thank you. Thank you for continuing <laughs> to keep that up. <laughs> um, so we we have used Craig uh, here in my household for uh, we occasionally do some tabletop gaming online. And uh, several people in our group are just head over heels for Discord. And just the other day, we ran into a problem, and I promised my wife I would ask you about this. Why can Craig not make two recordings at the same time? <laughs> if you have two separate oh, rooms God. going. Okay, this is... This is I'm sorry, this but I told her I'd ask. Discord gonna Discord. Uh, so I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mention, only because you are thanking me for, for maintaining Craig, that I am trying not to. I am in the process of finding a replacement maintainer for Craig right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Because maintaining it is genuinely hellacious. It's it's an awful process. Uh, but I, I can I can talk to you about exactly why Craig doesn't support multiple uh, uh, channels. So the Discord bot API doesn't let a single bot join multiple voice channels. Why? <laughs> because they wrote it that way. Uh, but. Uh, you can easily run multiple bot instances and have them join multiple channels. But as Craig really ballooned in popularity, I started getting a lot of connection difficulties. Uh, so I had to disable all of the secondary Craigs, uh, the, the ones who could record multiple channels at the same time, just because I was getting all of these connection problems uh, from Discord, from this sort of ballooning popularity. Uh, so, you know, blame all other Craig users. <laughs> <laughs> So if somebody really wanted to, they could take your source code because it's it's on it's on GitHub. The Craig source is on GitHub. Yep. Uh, so somebody could take their own, yep. rename it to Craig Two, and invite Craig Two Bot to their uh, their second Discord channel and just run that one themselves, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I, I can't trademark the name Craig. It just is a human <laughs> name. You could even just call it Craig <laughs> if you wanted to. <laughs> There you go. So it's it's some legwork, but there's a solution. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so working with Discord is a huge pain, and you're trying to pass off Craig. How did that bring you to Onwecaster? 
Uh, it's actually the reverse. Uh, so I, as I mentioned, I sort of, I created Craig because people had jumped ship to Discord and I sort of, I needed an emergency solution and I did not anticipate how, uh, frankly, just badly implemented Discord's, uh, voice bot API is. It's, it's just buggy. Uh, but as it started to gain popularity, I asked people, like, why are you using Craig? It's it's not a double-ender. It's, it's recording after internet transmission. And a lot of people were using Craig to record podcasts, which kind of horrified me because, <laughs> like, okay, I'm just going to throw quality in the garbage. No, no local recording for me. Uh, and the reason was just that it... It synchronizes really well. Uh, the The synchronization I do is the best synchronization you're going to find because very, very few people understand how to do that. Uh, and it was sort of good enough quality for what they needed. Uh, and the, a lot had actually jumped ship to what have now become the, the competitors to uh, on WeCaster from these other online uh, recording services because the competitors did not do synchronization correctly of all of the the like basic features that they ought to have they would drift out of sync uh and i i knew how to do synchronization correctly so the first impetus for on wecaster was just obviously people need this kind of platform but just implemented competently uh and then you know after a, a couple years of, of implementing and then spinning out and working on whatever on wecaster it became the only platform i use for recording uh and so i i kind of no longer well i i definitely no longer use Craig at all and maintaining a piece of software you don't use where most of the maintenance is just fighting discord uh, yes. is not really a sort of practical thing to do. So it's I'm hoping I can find somebody who actually is. What it is. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I'm hoping I can find somebody who, who uses it and uses Discord and can sort of maintain it with love rather than the obvious spite and vitriol that I have developed. <laughs> well, well who, who would that be? I mean, you must have some kind of entity in mind for, I mean, we'll, we don't help you sell this thing or hand it off or whatever it is. So, <laughs> so, so what's the profile of that person? Is it just another hacker or is it, you know, somebody with so, money and a team or what? What is that? So the problem is that the the biggest thing it needs is expertise in digital audio encoding. It shouldn't need expertise in digital audio encoding. But when I say that Discord is really bad at implementing their API, I'm not just being, you know, vindictive. Let me describe to you a regular occurrence with Discord. So the way that a regular user connects to almost any voice chat system is this protocol called WebRTC. WebRTC is based on another pro uh, the uh, multimedia part of WebRTC is based on another protocol called RTP. Uh, and then you use Opus, which is the audio encoding. And regular clients connect through that, whatever. Discord has their own terribly implemented middleman by which bots connect. And they try to just strip off the WebRTC and RTP information. But at least five times, they've just screwed that up and I've had to go and like hex edit the recorded audio and look at the specifications for Opus and RTP and WebRTC and say, okay, which bytes here aren't actually part of the encoded Opus data and which parts are? What do I need to look for? What do I need to cut out? It should not require that kind of expertise, but it does just because of working with Discord. And that's that's hard to find because people who have that kind of expertise in digital audio encoding aren't slumming it up on Discord. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you need that kind of expertise. So I, I, I'm wondering... Um, you of course you're you have a pseudonym and a pseudo face here <laughs> so so yep. you can make up a background uh, of where you where you got to how you got that expertise right i mean that you just described something that ordinary muggles can't do not even a lot of hackers can do so uh, how'd you get to where you are now i mean what what's give us a background story even if it's wrong just to make it interesting so so there i i'm i'm going to mention I, as, as a moral issue, I do not lie. And I realize that uh, uh, presenting a pseudonym 
kind of feels like a lie. I, 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 by my, I've told you quite clearly that this is not my real name and not my real face. Mm. That is not a lie. So anything I tell you about like my background that led to this is, is going to be true. That being said, it's not like I had any formal education in digital audio encoding. So there was a bit of a overlap that occurred, uh, which is obviously I've, I've been both formally and informally educated in programming. Uh, and when I was in university and high school, I was in clubs that did like video production and I was always the video editor. Uh, so I, I was not an on-screen personality or anything, but I, I always did the video editing. Uh, and that you know, gave me some expertise in, in obviously nonlinear video editors and that kind of thing. But secondarily to that, just out of my own curiosity, gave me a certain degree of expertise in, in the actual formats and encodings and that kind of thing. And the way that anybody becomes uh, an expert in digital audio or digital media in general is that they just have a curiosity and sort of uh, chase that down. Uh, there, there is the issue that like, you need a pretty good expertise just in sort of low-level programming in the first place because there is a lot of really bizarre ignorance out there. And if you just sort of Google for, you know, what's the best X to use for Y, oh, 90% of the results are flatly incorrect and do not understand the technology and do not understand how any of it works. So you have to be able to sort of approach things very skeptically. But if you have, you know, the, the necessary sort of low-level programming background, this is all things that you can pick up and it better be because that's the only way. There is no, you know, university of digital audio encoding. <laughs> wow. So, so actually, I, I, I want to get into, uh, uh, well, I want us all to get into many things. But first, I want to tell you about, uh, to, to take a break to say, tell, talk a bit about Club, Club Twit. Because um, Club Twit is just, is, is this thing that we have that's a great way to support the Twit network. As a member, you get access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, as well as other great benefits. There's a bonus Twit Plus feed, which includes footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit. As well, and there's a good ones on the show, as well as uh, bonus shows that we've started, uh, such as the Untitled Linux Show, hosted by Jonathan here, and uh, and uh, the Giz Fizz and other monthly members only content. And then there's a the community aspect. We have a really fun Discord server. We should, we're talking all about Discord here, and and you can record stuff off it with Craig. I'm sure that's available only for our Club Twit members. Uh, there you could chat with other members about the shows and many other various tech topics and non-tech topics. There's even a beer and cocktails chat there. Uh, so sign up to Club Twit for the cost of one fancy cup of coffee for, per month. That's just $7 a month that gets you into the club. And by the way, I paid that down the street this morning <laughs> for exactly that here in Los Angeles. So, um, And could have done a Club Twit instead. So yeah, for anybody else, head over to Club Twit uh, with go to Go to twit.tv slash club twit and join today. So, so, so back to the show here and <laughs> my thing, I have to put Zoom back in front again. Um, I, so this is a, maybe a weird question, but it, maybe it's not. Um, I, the older I get, the earlier it seems. It, it strikes me that uh, you were mentioning that, you know, that there's no advanced degrees in in uh, in in the kind of audio work that you that you do in audio processing in general. I'm kind of amazed at how bad a lot of it is myself, and I'm and I'm definitely a closer to Muggle than than Wizard on this stuff. But I'm an old audio guy. I'm a radio guy from way back, and and um, in the analog world. Yeah. And it seems to me that we're very early in whatever this becomes. We're very early in the internet. Even um, we're going to be digital for the next thousands of years. We're not going back. We're not going to become non-digital. We're digital beings now too. Um, but we're just, you know, we may not even be out of the ocean yet. We don't have four legs, so we still have gills. I mean, it's pretty early. And so where does this go? I mean, you're, you're a pioneer here. Where, I mean, if, if you were, it isn't so much like, where do you design the future, but where do you see it going? Or maybe you could do both. 
so it, it's it's certainly true mm. that that we're early, and I I, I do want to say just as a you know in, in case I've come across as disparaging anybody other than Discord who I intend to disparage uh, that <laughs> you know the the classic sort of analog audio engineering mm. th- that ain't going anywhere, and I make no claims of being a, a, any kind of audio engineer in that sense, and unfortunately the sort of analog audio engineering and also sort of audio mastering uh, and this sort of digital audio encoding stuff have become quite different domains of expertise. Uh, and it, it's unfortunate just because quite often the same person needs to deal with both of them and uh, they they don't actually have expertise in both of them. Uh, in terms of sort of where this kind of uh, technology goes, uh, I... I <laughs> Maybe I'm. I, I I've been so reactive in in how I have built these things. Like I have I have built things to scratch particular itches to to address particular needs, uh, and the the world of digital media is so sort of toxic with uh, patent trolls and that kind of thing that it's very difficult to sort of predict even just in the next. You know, how long until H-265 falls out of patent? H-265 was uh, six years ago, something. So we've still got 15 years left on that. And and as a consequence, like a lot of what we're working on now, uh, people are just going to get sued about for no reason for 15 years. So I think... A first step uh, uh, in my sort of idealistic view of the future, a good first step would just be open, non-patent encumbered technologies. And uh, luckily, things are kind of turning that way. Even sort of the, the king of patent trolls, Apple, joined the Alliance for Open Media and contributed to AV1. Uh, so perhaps, you know, we can we can really do better at understanding what the future is going to be if we can sort of escape the dark age of the misanthropic patent extortion gang, a.k.a. MPEG, uh, <laughs> controlling how people understand what media is. They all, they, I also want to disparage. Discord and MPEG, they, they, they make the list. <laughs> uh, so I, I could, we could definitely talk about the patent issues with media. I have fought them myself. Uh, I've, many of the things that you're saying resonate because I fought some of these battles too. Uh, I do want to ask, since we're, we're kind of tangential to it, if you, if you want to go into it all, why you've decided to go with the pseudonym instead of coming out with the, you know, your real name and face. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you have some thoughts on uh, why that made sense. Um. Uh, so it, it originally was, was nothing more than the fact that, you know, everybody uses some kind of screen name online, but mm-hmm. I am a, a rather eccentric person, not just in my digital persona, but in my real persona. And I, you know, I have no shame of any of the things that I do in digital life or in real life, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that I would benefit in any way from connecting them. <laughs> like, I, I have a job <laughs> that I love in which I am very eccentric and very visible, and having all of this stuff connected to that would not make that job better and could make it worse. Uh, And on the other hand, having that connected to my sort of digital being uh, doesn't sort of aid here because it's not sufficiently related that I can sort of claim it as my sort of proof of expertise or anything like that. So I I think it's, it's mostly just these don't, Having having that be a single sort of persona does not benefit anything, and as a general rule, protecting yourself online is a good idea, so I'm trying to keep these sort of uh, uh, universes separate from each other. <laughs> Sure, that makes sense. I know I know some other people online that that you know are obviously really good at what they do. That have made the uh, the same decision. Uh, 
the one that immediately comes to mind is lock picking lawyer, which I know that's kind of niche, but uh, most <laughs> people have heard of him. And he's the guy that, you know, uh, let's see, what's the best example. So someone sent him a package where a lock pick said, Oh no, you can't pick into these. They're impossible. And so he opens the package on the video and says, Oh, it's one of these. Well, here's the tool that I designed that is now being sold commercially to get into these. And he you know, pops it in there and he goes through it and, pops it open. He's like, oh, there you go. You actually can get into him. And he is entirely anonymous. Today All you see we have a professional door lock, which I'm going to open with a magnet. Yes, <laughs> that's, the, that's the guy. That's the guy. And uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Aunt Pruitt on top of it, I tell you what. And, and that's all you ever see of him is his hands. And he talked about that. I, I listened to an audio where he presented at a security conference and he addressed why he did that. And uh, he made the statement that he has now become popular enough that he gets legitimate death threats, very inappropriate things sent to him from time to time. And he has found multiple trackers in things sent to him. And he's like, I have absolutely no intention to ever reveal more about myself because people on the Internet are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to say I, I totally get why one would not necessarily want to put everything out there for people to be able to see. <laughs> so you you mentioned with on recaster some of the other options not doing sync very well and i have to ask uh is uh obs ninja i believe they've now rebranded to video ninja is that one of those alternatives that doesn't necessarily handle sync correctly uh so I, I must say, I don't know enough about Video Ninja to answer that. I actually think that Video Ninja, given that it's it's sort of based on a plug-in to OBS, and OBS definitely does do synchronization well, I think that it's probably fine. I, I don't want to, you know, go on the record saying that because I don't know that that's true. <laughs> uh, but I, I suspect it's probably fine. I, so Video Ninja, what I found, like the, the reason why I didn't just direct people to Video Ninja is I think it's a bit fiddly. Uh, it's also not very portable. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, on WeCaster, it is a bit fiddly for the host, but the, for the guest, you click a link, type in your name, and now you're in the recording. That You don't even have to click record. Like, there's nothing to it for a guest. Uh, so the the ease of use is a thing, and I, I think that's a bit inescapable for Video Ninja just because of the sort of environment they are based on, uh, which is it's not a complaint about Video Ninja. I, I, I have perfect respect for, for that competitor, which is open source. <laughs> Um, but the, the issue, so, okay, let's, let's go into a tangent about how you do synchronization correctly, which is a topic yes. I could talk on literally for hours. Uh, so classic audio guy. Uh, so you've got two reel to reel tapes. One of them is hooked up to one microphone. One of them is hooked up to another microphone. Three, two, one, click your, you know, fingers on both the record and play buttons on both, uh, uh, real to real machines and you click and you record for a bit and it's all fine. Except of course, if you record for say two hours, because there's absolutely no way that these two systems are perfectly in sync, uh, in sync for as long as two hours. And that's just as true of a digital system. If it's perhaps even worse of a computerized system than uh, as it is on a real to real machine. And a lot of the competitors to on WeCaster, the way they work is three, two, one, click. <laughs> like internally, they're just doing a local recording that's just expecting, well, I'm going to get 48,000 samples a second. So if we're all getting 48,000 samples a second, then I can just plunk, stick the audio next to each other, and that'll be perfect. And the clocks will never drift out of sync, and Einstein can go to hell. And, you know, all of it, it'll work out absolutely perfectly. Nothing could go wrong. Nobody's system will ever be overloaded. Uh, it, it's not, it is not the way to do synchronization in a digital system. The nice thing about a digital system is that this being a network system, it's packetized. Uh, and so we don't have a continuous stream of data. We have a bunch of packets of data. I can just throw a timestamp on literally every single packet and then figure out in post, okay, given these timestamps and these chunks of audio, how do I align those on uh, an actual sort of continuous audio stream? And that's how on WeCaster does it. And the competitors don't. 
And a lot of them really do. They just, like, three, two, one, click. That's that's how they record, and that is not going to work. That is not a good way to, to keep synchronization for a long recording. It's fine if you're going to record for half an hour. It is not good if you're going to be recording for three hours, four hours. You And on Recaster, you also have taken the additional challenge of using video as well, don't you? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, and it, uh, so it's, you, it's exactly the same. It produces, so, uh, it, uh, the video is, is obviously packetized because it's in frames. And so every single frame is timestamped and there you go. You got a video stream that's perfectly in sync with everything else. There, there is a, a bit of complication with that because the, the timestamps for a stream are different from the timestamps from a static video. So you have to go through and uh, essentially, yep. if I understand correctly, resample those to make them start at zero. And uh, yep. I have spent I have spent far too many hours, and I've not gotten as deep into it as you have, but I've spent far too many hours fighting synchronization issues. I mean, way back in the day when, when we first started trying to stream to Facebook from OBS and we would get, you know, audio and video like almost up to a minute out of sync at the end of the video. And it was just... There's terrible problems. So the idea that somebody yep. actually has it fixed for something, it, 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 makes, it makes me feel good, warm and fuzzy, <laughs> because it's such a hard <laughs> problem to fix. <laughs> well, so in a way, the solution is quite simple. The, it's just the problem is the solution is very deep into the system. Like if you just take... FFmpeg. I love FFmpeg. I am not going to say anything negative about FFmpeg here, but FFmpeg was mostly meant to work with streams of video and audio. If you just take FFmpeg and you say, okay, record from these two audio devices, it'll drift out of sync because it expects them to be perfect streams. But then to fix that, you really do have to get in at a very, very low level and start timestamping things and correcting it. So the, the solution is in a way not that complicated. It's just that in order to even be able to do that solution, you already need to be like neck deep in mud. <laughs> Well, it, you may not want to uh, disparage FFmpeg, but I, I will go out on a limb and mention <laughs> uh, the FF server component of FFmpeg is mm -hmm. not good and is not properly <laughs> maintained. And they should, uh, I, I really had to hold myself back there from saying something I might regret. But uh, no, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not maintained and they should really just kill it um, because it's terrible. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, so I, I would I would agree with that, and it, it does feel like a a component that someone contributed years ago, and that was the person who cared about it, and that person no longer contributes to FFmpeg, so now it's been sitting <laughs> bit rotten away for some number of years. Yes, and then on top of that, you you had at least at the time. Now that everything is built on Chromium, it's a little bit easier. But at the time, you had to try to support Internet Explorer and Edge and Firefox and Chrome and Safari, and oh, video streaming was so hard. Oh, it was ridiculous. <laughs> I'm I mean, curious with. It is yeah, not ahead. a good thing that everything is built on Chromium. I, I'm just I'm gonna throw that out there that the the severe decline in uh, diversity in web browsers is very troubling, and I I do not like a future where your browser choices are Chrome, 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 or Chrome. I I am a stand I I am a, a holdout Firefox user if for no other reason than it is the one that isn't Chrome. <laughs> I I built computers with AMD processors for a very similar reason for the longest time. Um, yes, it would be a terrible thing for Firefox to go away, but I shed no tears for the death yeah. of Internet Explorer and Edge. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so uh, on WeCaster, it, is there... Uh, obviously, it's, it's multi-track recording for both audio and video. It, is that... Uh, does it... Does it rely on the internet connection of whoever you're talking to, or does it have a sane local recording option for everybody? It, of course, does local recording. Uh, so 
you might rely on the internet connection in that you probably want to also talk to them live <laughs> to have the conversation that you're recording. Uh, but for the recording itself, that is that is local recording. It is transmitted to the server, but reliably uh, using this amazing new technology called TCP, uh, invented, you know, <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, the, the, so the recording is, is local. It is not processed that. So, you know, the, the to, to be in an uh, interview like this, of course, the, there's the conversation about, okay, make sure your, your settings are like this. And a lot of, you know, if it's just going to be voice chat, the settings are going to be, okay, do echo cancellation and do automatic game control. All of those settings are just ruin my audio in this way, ruin my audio in that way, ruin my audio in this yes. way. Uh, so on WeCaster is designed not to do that by default. Uh, so there's, there's little things like that, but the big thing is just, yeah, it, it records locally and then transmits that recording, uh, uh, reliably uh that that has the extra sort of implication that it needs to constantly keep its syn its clock synchronized with the server's clock uh which is not necessary for craig which just is going to receive audio and timestamp it whatever it gets it uh but regardless yep that that uh that is how it works it does local reliable recording both audio and video and then transmits that reliably to the server uh, was there any challenge using the TCP? And I'm assuming a lot of this probably tunnels over HTTPS. So, you know, you've got abstraction on top of abstraction. What, was there a problem trying to get low latency audio and video? Well, luckily, the latency for the actual recording doesn't matter. The latency for the, the recording is, is not that important. Now, I'm going to say... The actual live chat experience on a WeCaster does have worse latency than than a lot of the competitors. Zoom right now is having everybody's lunch in terms of of low latency communication uh, because Zoom knows what they're doing for that component for the actual sort of live communication more so than anybody else does. Uh, I am working on things to to deal with the live uh, communication and the fact that it is transmitting whatever you're recording live means it's using a bunch of that bandwidth for the actual recording and that's what's hurting the the live experience the the latency so uh, the the answer is sort of yes and no uh did I need to do anything to, to handle the latency? Well, no, it doesn't actually matter because the recording can have almost arbitrary latency as long as it's delivered reliably. Uh, but I am needing to do something to deal with the latency because the fact that you're recording means that the live chat gets less bandwidth to play with. So, so I have a, a Chromium question. I, I, Chromium is a, uh, is a Google thing. They start just like Android is a Google thing. Is for browsers. Um, who's working on it? I don't even know who's working on it besides Google. I mean, if this is the thing that we have to live with, does Google totally control that? Like to do kind of with Android, or is it is it something that somebody could jump into and, and say, okay, I'm going to fix some things here. The situation is actually very similar to Android in that uh, Google is, you know, the, it is it is under their control. They are the the dictators of Chromium, but it's not like Google is the only contributors to Chromium. The you know the the other users of it do actually contribute to it, and I I don't think that Chromium is a bad piece of software at all. The fact that I, I like I don't like the uh, reduced diversity of web browser software just because reduced diversity of software is bad in general, uh, th there's a reason Chromium has sort of won out. It's a really good piece of software. It's a really good web browser engine. Um, so it is it is controlled by Google, but uh, it, it definitely has input. And I feel like if Google, you know, dropped the ball, a fork would be forthcoming. And there are enough big names behind it that there could actually be successful forks of it. Uh, unlike say, Firefox that, you know, if Mozilla can't, if Mozilla runs out of money and can't maintain that, then it's highly unlikely that, that anybody else is going to be able to sort of pick up the, pick up from where they left off. There's, there are enough hands in Chromium, even if they are not is sort of in control that, uh, uh, it could sort of continue even if Google turns even more evil than they already are. <laughs> So on WeCaster is 
uh, it, it's built out of, from what I can tell looking at it, it's built out of multiple open source components. Like uh, I believe Jitsi is used in there and some other things. Uh, what's yep. what's the overall license of it and uh, how difficult would it be for someone to set up their own instance? Uh, so my components are in the ISC license. If you don't know the ISC license, uh, wh recently when there was this war for who can make the shortest license that means the exact same thing, uh, <laughs> ISC kind of won that in that it's the one that made it into OSI and is is the shortest that means the exact same thing as the MIT license. Uh, so my components are under the ISC license. I do use FFmpeg all over the place, and FFmpeg is under LGPL, so the whole thing uh, is at least under the LGPL, and then there are even a couple GPL components. Uh, so the whole thing is under the GPL, though you can sort of strip out those components if you wanted to. Uh, that being said, most of the components that are there, this is sort of building for uh, uh, for JavaScript or building into WebAssembly, depending. Uh, and so they are somewhat off the shelf in that you don't really need to do local builds of the entire thing. So the process of setting up a uh, an OnWeCaster server it's not simple. There are a lot of, of bits that need to be run. There is an installation document in the OnWeCaster server repository that I don't particularly maintain, but I sort of have for my own purposes for setting up my own test uh, instances. It is, it is the kind of thing that if you are a Unix expert, you can definitely do it, no problem. Uh, if, you know, uh, so I, I have... Uh, let me actually quote this exactly. It'll take me a second to, to bring this up. In the uh, Craig repository, I have some suggestions for, for who can run Craig, and it goes like this. Running Craig is not like running any other bot. Most of the complexity in Craig is not in the bot itself, but in the audio processing. If you are not familiar with C and Unix, do not waste your time or mine. If you delude yourself into thinking you will host Craig on Windows, do not waste your time or mine. Craig is not merely built for Unix. Craig is built on the Unix philosophy, which is just as true as on, uh, on Wecaster. This one time I ran a Linux VM is not sufficient. I can use putty, won't cut it. If the word Windows doesn't make your skin crawl, you are not the kind of person who will succeed in running Craig. Uh, so the same the same goes for on Wecaster. On Wecaster is built on the Unix philosophy. It's all pipes. <laughs> it's all pipes. Uh, and so all if pipes. you are happy with that, then you can run on Wecaster. It's not that complicated. It's all pipes all the way down. <laughs> it's all pipes. <laughs> I like it. Uh, we did we did have a question from the chat room that I can go ahead and, and get in. And that is, what do you think, and I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but uh, SRWare Iron, it's another one of the browsers out there. Is that one you, you're familiar with? Uh, I have not heard of that one. Uh, is it actually using its own, the browser of the future. Wow. I already it's hate Chromium it based, based on that title. Uh, <laughs> it's Chromium based. Yeah. So <laughs> the thing is, you know, Chrome, Chrome can dress up in drag. Chrome can wear as many costumes as it wants. It's still Chrome. I, you know, I, I'm, I, you want to use edge. You want to use opera. You want to use uh, brave. You want to use SR wear. Great. You're using Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious what, uh, goodness, we have a little bit of whiplash here going back and forth between the topics. Uh, what has the uptake been on, on WeCaster? Have you, have you had some excitement around it? You know, are quite a few people using it? Uh, so I, I don't want to release exact numbers. It is certainly sure. paying for itself, which is good. Oh, yeah, uh, good the number of subscribers is uh, uh, in in the tens, in the mid tens. So <laughs> not amazing, but certainly <laughs> well more than sufficient to pay for itself. <laughs> what is quite surprising to me, so on WeCaster has both a subscriber model and an a la carte model. You can pay mm -hmm. by the hour. Uh, and if you're recording less than like 10 hours a month, then paying by the hour is, is cheaper. And and the uptake on a la carte has been way more than I expected. I, I think 
there's probably more a la carte recordings being made than uh, subscription recordings being made. Uh, mm -hmm. So on the one hand, that's great. Obviously, my choosing this model was was good. I had good foresight there. On the other hand, that means I don't really have a very good sense of how, of its sort of longevity of popularity because are these people recording one thing and then they go, oh, well, yeah, that worked. Okay, bye. <laughs> Never using it again. Uh, so... It's, it is sufficient to maintain uh, the servers, and that is all I needed it to be. Uh, and, and on WeCaster, unlike Craig, is, is to a certain extent kind of self-maintaining in that uh, I'm not chasing some other piece of software that I'm trying to deal with their bugs. Any bugs are my own. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's great. It's fine. It's paying for itself. That's all I needed. <laughs> So it's it's not your plan to uh, quit your day job and become the Ennui Caster guy full time. <laughs> I mean, if Ennui Caster becomes vastly more successful than it is, then I, I could consider that. I actually love my day job, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's you know, it, it, it could be considered, but it certainly isn't going to be right now. <laughs> Okay, so we're we're getting toward the end of the hour. We always uh, wrap up with uh, with four questions. Um, the the first is it, it, again, it's kind of our control question, and which is, uh, do you have anything to say at all about blockchain? <laughs> we should probably add Web three to that too now, as a as a as a as a, as a control here, question. Here is what I have to say about blockchain. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> Can, can you spell that? <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, spelled just like what I had to say about FF Server. H -H 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 -H. <laughs> <laughs> it's like spell a sneeze. Not easy to do. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, it, it, and, and in other words, are there any questions that we haven't asked that you'd like to us to have asked? I should have asked that one first. No, so I, I guess uh, uh, if if I really want to just get an opportunity to advertise, uh, then you could ask mm. the, about the pricing model for Odd Weecaster, and I could just uh, wax lyrical and advertise a bit. But that is purely advertisement. <laughs> well, that's fun. <laughs> Go for it's it. Give us your plug. Good. Yeah, we like so the plug. So on Weecaster does high quality, including up to, if you want to pay for it, literally lossless audio recording at uh, the lowest price in that field. Uh, that is web browser-based uh, multi-track recording. Uh, it is as cheap as $1 per hour if you want to record in uh, Opus. So that's lossy recording, $2 per hour for FLAC. Or you can get a subscription for $10 a month or $15 a month for Opus or FLAC, respectively. You can find more information on that at, on, at ecaster.com slash pricing. Uh, and of course, it's open source, so I did not mean to rhyme there. So if you want to run it yourself, you can run it yourself and not pay me a dime. I don't have a problem with that. It's just paying to run the servers, basically. That's fantastic. So um, the, the, the final questions are, um, what's your favorite text editor and scripting language? <laughs> uh, so... Uh, I, I still am a Vim user. I have recently, uh, l largely transitioned to NeoVim. Uh, NeoVim does feel very Neo, uh, so it's not quite as polished as I would like it to be yet. Uh, but I, yeah, uh, you know, people get stuck in their ways. Uh, I'm, I'm a Vim user. Uh, and I have already forgot. Oh, no, I've already forgotten what the second question was. Oh, yeah, scripting oh, language. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I hate all programming languages, but I hate some programming languages slightly less than other programming languages. Uh, I, I do think that for as messy and weird as JavaScript is, it has actually benefited from design by committee in a way that you would think could not possibly cause benefit. So early on, like JavaScript in Netscape was horrendous. It was a ridiculous language. And then Internet Explorer like badly implemented it. And what we ended up with was the subset 
that it was actually supported by both of them, which is kind of a small, object-oriented, prototype-based language that's not that bad. <laughs> it's not amazing, <laughs> but I hate all languages, so okay. Uh, so I, I think, you know, JavaScript has a nice center of, like, the language isn't so offensive that, it's, uh, that it makes me run screaming, and the implementation is really quite fast, which is nice. Uh, and you can use TypeScript to... to claw back some of the types from it. So I, I guess JavaScript is unfortunately my answer, though I'm not proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, it, it, it has been great having you on the show. This, and and uh, we say this to most guests, actually, which is we want to have you back. But especially where it, it's, a, it's, a moving, it's a moving target. And, and I, I have a sense, this may even be a question we could close with. Is there another topic? I mean, is there something that that you're looking at that's not the that's not Craig or on Wecast or that that's that got you troubled and you feel like you could step in and cure the cure the problem? <laughs> well, the, the 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 things that I think I could cure uh, lots of things, but not that I think that then my cure could could be sort of popular or used enough to matter in any mm -hmm. way. That's sort of a, like I, I fell into Odd Weecaster because people trust me from Craig, which I never expected to be popular. Uh, so I, I, you know, I definitely know how to do that right. But uh, I do think uh, so. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a brief brief plug about WebRTC. WebRTC is the the bad side of design by committee. WebRTC, which is what browser based uh, chat systems use for live chat, including Jitsi, uh, isn't good. <laughs> It, it it isn't good is the thing uh i am actually working on a uh, an alternative that i i don't know how it's going to work again it's sort of scratching an itch i want on wecaster to have better latency uh so perhaps at some point in the future we can talk about webrtc and uh, uh my alternative currently codenamed rt on we excellent that's fantastic we will look forward to that one and we'll have you on the show for that so, th so thanks Thank so much for being on here with us, and uh, mm -hmm. and we'll see you again soon. It's been fun. So, Jonathan, you <laughs> you carried the most water on that one, uh, and, and that yep. that was fantastic. That was that fantastic. was a blast. That was a lot of fun. You know, going into it, the the idea of talking to someone that's that's a pseudonym, which we've we've done that a time or two. But you know, there there's always that little bit of hesitation. I don't know how well this is going to go. But that was a lot of fun. Um, and I I mentioned it a couple of times, but uh, I have fought many of the same fights that uh, Giannis has, and uh, I find it fascinating to uh, to to see his solutions, and then you know, kind of diving into the whole uh, the the browser question, and you know. The, the the idea of uh, uh, the diversity of, of uh, solutions out there for some of these problems where everything is chromium and maybe that's not a good idea. Fascinating guest. It was a blast to talk to him. It's, you know, it, it's, it's funny. I, I was, I'm a connoisseur of accents and voices. I, I grew up in New York. I grew up talking like this and lived in the South a long time. And so I know how different Southern accents are. And I was trying to place where <laughs> Giannis is from, and he—it's it, interesting because his his speech is Americans mumble. We swallow the ends of our words, um, and and he doesn't. He, he very strongly enunciates everything, and very strong sibilance. And uh, at at the ends of um, uh, at, that's why I'm getting a call. You have to stop that. Um, uh, at, at the ends of his words, and it's hard to place. I still can't do it, <laughs> so so I don't have it. I my 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 X ray did not penetrate that wall, whatever that wall was. So, <laughs> uh, well, so so let's get into the in, in the, uh, the the plugs. You have yours. With, uh, tell us about what's going on for you with that. Yes. Yeah, so over at uh, Hackaday.com, of course, I've got the uh, weekly security column. Runs every Friday morning. Check that out. 
Uh, this upcoming Friday, you can be sure we're going to dive into Log4j. Uh, and if I get clearance to do it by then, I'm actually going to uh, break a little bit of security research that I have done um, regarding one of the topics that you know we like to talk about here on Floss Weekly all the time. I am hoping that uh, that will get cleared for release by then. Uh, so keep an eye out for that too, some original research. Nothing too <laughs> exciting, but it was fun. Fantastic. So I... I want to plug uh, next week. Uh, next week, we have another round table. Um, it'll be rectangular, <laughs> like it always <laughs> is. But uh, it'll have, I don't know who's going to be on yet, but it's going to be us, some other version of us. We have a number of co-hosts. So it'll be me and, uh, and, and at least two others, I think. So that's coming up, yeah, to close out the year. And that's going to be our last show for 2021. And then 2022 comes along, and that's easier to type, I noticed. I was typing 2022. <laughs> 2020 was good. I like 2020. <laughs> 2022 is easier than 2021. So after next week, we'll see you then. And But for now, we'll see you next week. It's Doc Searles Plus Weekly. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason... You're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show hands on photography here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So head on over to twit.tv hop. That's twit.tv hop and subscribe today. <laughs>